All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Yingling Fan. I'm the editor in chief at Urban Studies, uh, the uh, general, uh, international general for urban scholarship, um, and I'm also professor of urban and regional planning at uh, Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. On behalf of the Urban Studies General, uh, I'm delighted today to chair this year's Urban Studies uh, Annual Lecture. And this annual lecture will be delivered by Professor Karen Sito uh, at the Yale University's School of Environment. Before I introduce Professor Karen Sito uh, I, uh, and her lecture, I'd like to take a moment to briefly introduce uh, the Urban Studies General's uh, annual lecture series. As you know, Urban Studies uh, was established in uh, 1964, so this year marks uh, our uh, 58th uh, year of birth. Um, and uh, we welcome all original sub uh, submissions that further our understanding of uh, urban condition. Uh, and also the rapid changes that are taking place in cities and regions across the globe. We establish, uh, we especially favor uh, studies that contributed to a wider urban theoretical and conceptual understanding. The journal itself, as I mentioned, was established in 1964, but the annual lecture series was uh, uh, is much younger. Uh, so we established the annual uh, lecture series in 2015. Um, and uh, this series uh, invite and uh, recognize uh, eminent urban scholars um, who will speak on a subject of their choosing as well as uh, uh, to an audience of their choosing. So this year, uh, Professor Karen Sito uh, decided to deliver uh, her lecture at uh, Royal Geographical uh, Society annual conference. Uh, just for your information, uh, similar to the previous annual lectures that have been delivered, this lecture will be recorded and it is also uh, live streamed currently. Uh, we will, uh, and the lecture was subsequently posted online. In, ad in addition, a printed version uh, of this lecture will be published in the journal uh, in an urban access format. So today, um, I am honored to have a Professor Karen Sito to deliver this year's uh, annual lecture. Uh, professor Sito is a Frederick Hickson, Professor of Geography and uh, urban, uh, Urbanization Science at Yale University's School of the Environment. She is one of the world leading experts on contemporary urbanization and the global environment change. The overarching objective of uh, Professor Karen Sito's research is to understand how urbanization will affect uh, the planet. Um, I wanted to mention uh, that uh, Professor Sito has served on numerous national and international scientific bodies. Uh, sh uh, most notably, she has been a coordinating lead author for two United Nations climate change reports, the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, the sixth assessment report published uh, this year uh, in 2022, and the IPCC fifth assessment report published uh, in 2014. So in both reports, uh, she co-led the chapter on urban mitigation of climate change. I also wanted to mention that uh, Professor Sito has received many awards for her scientific contributions. She is an elected member of the US National Academy of Science the American Academy of Arts and the Sciences, and also a fellow with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. When it comes to contribution to urban studies, Professor Sito has uh, moderni uh, modernized the study of urbanization by applying new geographic data and tools to understand the global impacts of local urban processes. Her seminal urban 
remote sensing studies have illustrated the power of big data and the millions of pixels to elucidate urban processes on the ground. Her research has brought urbanization to the attention of global change communities. Professor Sito calls herself a geographer um, and an urban scientist and uh, utilizes geographic, uh, systematic, comparative, and empirical approaches in her study of urbanization. Her writing emphasizes uh, that uh, the subject of her research is the process of, urba of um, urbanization, using the term as a verb. While traditionally urban studies has focused on the city, its environment, and the activity within it, Professor Sitter's work has focused on the linkage between urbanization and other systems, um, such as land and atmosphere uh, and bio biota. She has promoted the importance of natural science perspectives and the paradigms in the study of urbanization, providing new urban-centric uh, frameworks for sustainability science. As such, her work has placed urbanization as an important component of other areas of inquiry, such as biodiversity loss and climate change. So today, the title of this annual lecture is uh, 21st Urbanization and the Grand Challenges for Global Sustainability. In her talk, Professor Sita will discuss trends in urbanization the challenges they present for global sustainability. Uh, she will present uh, key findings uh, from the 2022 IPCC report and uh, other new studies uh, that documented the effects of urbanization on land, biodiversity, food systems, and the regional and uh, global climate. Um, so please uh, give a, a round of applause to welcome Professor Sito to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind and generous introduction, and I really want to thank the journal for uh, inviting me to give this annual lecture. It's really quite an honor to be here, and it's really wonderful to see so many people in the audience live at 5 o'clock, so thank you for being here. Um, so as, as, as said in the introduction, um, the gist of my talk today is to place urbanization as a process in a larger discussion about the, the global environmental challenges that we're facing. And in a nutshell, to offer new perspectives of how we could frame urbanization as key to the solutions to so many global environmental challenges that we face. I'm gonna start off with this picture of the city. This is classic Athens. Um, and I would argue that despite hundreds of years of literature on the city and urbanization, the dominant framework that many people have of the city or urbanization is this one. Even if it's not explicit, it is implicit in how we talk about cities as places. It's implicit in the data that we collect. It's implicit in how we think about cities as solutions. And when I say we, I mean policymakers from the very local to international. And I'll get to that a little bit more uh, momentarily. In this talk and in most of my work, I t when I talk about urbanization, I'm thinking of a process. I am talking about it as a verb. And specifically, I reference urbanization, or I talk about it, as having five very clear dimensions. The first dimension that everybody talks about is urbanization as a demographic process. It's the process of people moving into urban areas, people moving into cities, cities growing out. 
So it's, it's clearly this is a data set or the, this, this graphic here that shows the growth in urban population is probably a graph that everybody in this room knows, right? I see uh, some people rolling their eyes like, yeah, we've seen this many, many times. But it's not just about the population size that lives in cities. There's also a whole structural aspect to urbanization that does not get talked about as much where average household sizes are declining, the nuclear family is changing. There's this whole other demographic aspect of urbanization that is critically important to global changes, but that does not get discussed very much. So there's one dimension of urbanization, which is the demographic dimension. There's a second dimension of urbanization, which is that clearly urbanization is an economic process. These people here are not in an urban place. It doesn't matter really where they are, it's clear from what they are doing that they are not engaged in the urban economy. But there are lots of other images of the urban economy that's primarily about manufacturing, it's primarily about the service sector, um, and clearly work that takes place in an urban economy is fundamentally different in terms of where it takes place, the social interactions of the urban economy. But the key point that I want to make here is that clearly there's an economic dimension to urbanization that's linked to the, de the, the demographic dimension. There's a, a third dimension to urbanization, which is the most visible one, which is the land use changes that, that accompany the demographic changes, that accompany the economic changes. And some of these land use changes look like this picture of Levittown of, of suburban development, or it could be um, uh, disconnected single family housing. But a lot of what's happening in 21st century urbanization is underground subsurface infrastructure development that's incredibly complex, that is hidden to the naked eye, but is critical for ensuring that our cities operate. Then I would argue there are two other dimensions of urbanization today that are also critically important, but also don't get discussed in as much as needs to be, but also don't get discussed in the context of the other dimensions. And one of these dimensions is around governance and institutions. I have here a very simple organization chart from the village of Bartlett in the state of Illinois, which is a pretty simple, clear organization chart. Bartlett's a small village. This is the org chart for the city of New York from just a few months ago, much more complex. And every single one of these boxes actually has a hidden layer of another set of organizations. And so clearly, in order to have our cities function in a way, in, in effective ways, they need to be very, they need to have very complex organizations and institutions. So there's, there's this other dimension to urbanization. And then last but not least, I would argue there's clearly a cultural dimension to urbanization where norms change, our expectations change, our interactions change, the amount of space that we feel comfortable around another person in cities is really different than in non-urban places. Um, our ideas about cleanliness, about sanitation, are very different in urban spaces. So that it's not just about, you know, there's not just one single notion of what's clean or sanitary. Um, but urban norms are actually changing um, uh, significantly. Our ideas about freshness is also changing in cities. Um, here's a picture of a, uh, a market in Hong Kong, um, but anyone who's gone to a grocery store in a, doesn't have to be a city, but a modern uh, food delivery, you can see on the top here, there's a, a sign that says, always fresh reminding us of what fresh is. And in case you forgot, these things are fresh. But our concept of freshness is also changing in cities. 
it's not just about the delivery of foods that haven't been refrigerated or things that haven't been frozen, but increasingly we've, we're accepting that foods that are packaged are also considered fresh. So throughout this talk, when I talk about urbanization, I'm actually referring to all five of these dimensions of change that are happening simultaneously. So for the bulk of my talk, what I'd like to do is uh, discuss how urbanization presents a number of simultaneous challenges for global sustainability on these four different topics. So I'll start off with land. So clearly urbanization as a land change process and also as a demographic process requires land. It requires land to build the infrastructure, the housing, the buildings that house people and their activities. If we look at urban land development, so urbanization as a land process over the next 30 some odd years, we will see large scale urban land change at a level that's never happened before in the history of, uh, in, in history, period. So here's a, a table that shows urban land expansion from 2015 to 2050 under five different scenarios. So if we look at this uh, middle of the road scenario or this sustainability scenario, um, these are the two most likely or that we hope to be mo most likely uh, scenarios um, of, uh, uh, that will happen in the future going out to 2050. Um, and you can see that the, the, t the, the new urban land that will be developed over the next 35 years actually is significantly more than all the urban land that actually is in place uh, today. Another way to think about this is that over the next 35 to 40 years, we're expected to see about 20,000 American football fields becoming urban land areas every day, every single day, 20,000 American football fields or another way to think about this, since we are in Europe, we are still kind of in Europe, depending on how you, your politics, I guess. Um, depending on how you see it, uh, it's the combination of these four European countries will become urban over the next 35 to 40 years. So we're talking about a really large land area. But it's not just the land, it's also the resources that are required to build up that infrastructure. So here, what I have here are uh, figures that show um, urban development on the, on the, on the horizontal axis, on the, on the x-axis. These are data from um, the night lights. So it's basically showing outward lateral growth of cities as measured by lights at night. And on the y-axis, this is urban development in the three-dimensional in the more volumetric growth as measured by scatterometers also on satellites. And the different colors indicate how much of that particular pixel was urbanized um, in uh, uh, 1999. And so what you see here for Indian City, so let's take, uh, let's, let, let's take a look at Chennai. So over a 10 year period, much of Chennai's growth was more lateral and the size of the area sh tells you how much of, you know, how much land was taken up. So there was a lot of new lateral growth. In contrast, if we look at Kanpur, there's a little bits of lateral growth, but not very much. If we look at, let's say, Delhi. Delhi has uh, more arrows growing up and they're colored arrows. So that means that during this 10-year period, Delhi had a lot of upward volumetric urban expansion. So this two-dimensional, these two-dimensional two -dimensional graphs tell us a little bit about the resources that are required to build these cities. So the story here is that Indian cities are primarily growing outward. So you can imagine a lot of these gray arrows were less than 20% urban. So they were probably agriculture, maybe there were forested areas, but 
they were something other than dense urban areas. So let's go to the next slide. These are African cities. Uh, you can see Khartoum here has um, a lot more lateral development that's increasing in density. So these are the, the purple are, are cells that went from about 80 or 70% up to about 100% urban. Let's look at Kano here. Little bits of urban growth. So you can imagine this is probably uh, more disconnected, disparate, but small scale, relatively small scale. So my th next slide, I'm gonna show six Chinese cities. So those of you streaming online won't be able to participate, but those of you in person, what do you think the next set of slides will look like? So if this is lateral growth and this is volumetric growth. What, what do you think it's gonna look like? What are the colors? Yes, please. Okay, so a person in the back says, making a motion, they're gonna go psh. Okay. All right, <laughs> very scientific, exactly. So perfectly correct. So Chinese cities over this 10 year period have grown both laterally, but a lot of upward volumetric growth. So when I look at these data, I see concrete, reinforced steel, aluminum, copper, and indeed, if we look at the resources that are going to be required to build the cities of tomorrow, the United Nations um, International Research Panel concludes that the high demand for such raw materials far exceeds what the planet can sustainably provide. It's estimated that over the next 40 years, the raw materials that are going to be needed will be double in 2050 what they were in 2010. So what this tells me is that clearly we cannot build cities of tomorrow the way that we have been building them in the past. So that's just about land and resources. But let's change gears a little bit to think about urbanization's impact on food systems. So all around the world, um, the, I've seen pe people have sent me pictures like these. Uh, this is a picture taken from uh, China where urban residential high-rises uh, high are um, abutting uh, prime agricultural land. But it's happening not only in China, it's also in the US, it's in Egypt, and like I said, uh, people send me pictures from all around the world where urbanization is taking place on prime agricultural land. We've done some work in my lab where we've looked, at see, looked to see how much agricultural land will be taken up by future patterns of urbanization. So this study was published uh, in 2016 where we looked at urbanization's impact on agricultural land going out to 2030. So if we look at the global picture, uh, the global picture is not so dire. Um, if we assume no new agricultural land brought into production, urbanization will take about 2% of the world's cropland. So that is assuming that in 2010, no new agricultural land gets brought into production. So we're gonna lose about 2% of the world's cropland. And on average, this cropland that we're losing to urbanization will be more productive than global averages. So we are taking out of production some of the prime agricultural land all around the world. But if we move from the global story to the regional story, this is where the story gets very, changes very quickly. Um, I've highlighted here just four countries, uh, Nigeria, Pakistan, Egypt, and Vietnam, where urbanization is expected to result in about a third of Egypt's crop being lost, cropland being lost, and for Vietnam, about 10%. So regionally, some countries are going to lose a significant portion of their croplands due to urban expansion. And in many of these countries, these are also countries where a large portion of the economy is also agrarian. So we're losing both croplands and also livelihoods. 
If we look at just Africa, uh, Africa is expected to lose a large percentage of its cr cash crops. So for example, if we look at uh, rice production, about 19% of rice production, a little bit more than a quarter of the wheat production, land for wheat production will be lost to uh, urban urbanization. So the impact of urbanization on food systems on the on the supply side will be pretty acute depending on what region of the world we're looking at. But there's a whole other side to urbanization's uh, impact on food systems, which is on the, on the demand side. And if you look at this literature, um, I would argue that the literature is not very satisfying because essentially the literature assumes that urbanization equals people getting richer equals people eating more meat. That's primarily what this, the dominant literature argues. It's pretty simplistic. It doesn't discuss any of the five dimensions that I discussed at the beginning, these, you know, these changes in household dynamics, changes in culture, in norms, and ideas about freshness. Um, but the story is that as people get richer, they go from, um, from harvesting wild plants to eating legumes to uh, more refined grains, dairy, sugars, and then meats at the top of the uh, pyramid. But we've done some pretty detailed studies in India where it seems that this is not the story that's happening in India and certainly not in other places. We're observing a, a quite different kind of urban nutrition transition, one that's partly characterized by a large percentage of food away from home. So as demographics change and we don't have people at home being able to cook all meals from scratch, uh, more food is now prepared outside of the home or as some of the marketers will say, they're being assembled at home. So you can buy the different ingredients and assemble your food at home. But what we're seeing is that there's a large percentage of food that is now consumed away from home. And the other thing we're seeing is that there's a lot more food waste as well as people are eating more food away from home. There's a whole other aspect to urbanization's impact on food systems through the cold chain, cold chain logistics. I imagine every single one of us has a refrigerator do you ever stop to think about all the food that has to be kept cold from the farm to your house? Massive amounts of cold storage, um, warehouses, trucks, specialized trucks that hold refrigerated foods, frozen foods, and then of course the entire shipping industry, whether it's on ships, cargo ships, or whether it's air freight, um, we're now sending much more perishable items like seafood in specialized containers on airplanes. We raise certain types of fish that can actually live outside of water for 12 hours. Um, skate is one of those fish that can live for a long time. Um, it's an entire industry around keeping food cold and the environmental impacts of keeping food cold so that we can have our Ben and Jerry's or well, milk or whatever it is, is pretty significant. And this literature is only just beginning to scratch the surface on the, the energy costs and the environmental costs of the cold chain. I put this up here mainly because I wanted us to think about urbanization's effect on food systems, both on the supply side, but also on the demand side and how complex it is. So we've moved from land to food. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about biodiversity. Globally, we see that habitat loss is one of the major drivers of biodiversity loss in all systems. This graph shows um, on the y-axis, this is the median change of habitat range size. You see the significant decline in range size, habitat range sizes, declining almost uh, nearly 
And on the x-axis, this is global agriculture and urban areas in million hectares. And so as agricultural lands get expanded and as urban areas get expanded, they are both taking place on habitats and on wildlife corridors. But it's not just the direct impact of urban development that affects habitats. There are a lot of other ways in which urbanization affects um, biodiversity. And one of the principal methods is through nighttime lighting. There is a growing literature that is showing that nighttime lights has a number of deleterious impacts on biodiversity. Uh, this is a study that looks at nighttime lights effect on nocturnal taxa. So in other words, species that uh, forage and primarily live at night. And so if you, if you have areas that are lit up all the time at night, it affects these nocturnal species, their ability to forage, their ability to mate and reproduce, having a significant impact really all around the world. So there's a nighttime light effect on biodiversity. There's another aspect of um, urbanization's impact on biodiversity that is also getting a lot more attention these days, which is how urbanization is actually accelerating evolution. So I have a couple of examples here from a study that was published about five years ago. So this is a, a mutation rate in rural, urban, and extreme manufacturing town. And you see that the mutation rate is uh, much higher for the manufacturing town in urban versus in rural. And then this is a, a measure of diversity on the y-axis here. And you can see with increasing impervious surface, there is this declining in, um, in diversity. Lots of studies, very detailed urban ecology studies being done all around the world that is showing that the diversity is declining in cities, but it's also declining in and around cities. And what's interesting here is that the modification of habitats is actually interacting with the nighttime lights to create new species and also affecting the diversity of species that currently already exist. So there's a direct impact through land use change, there's an indirect impact through lights, and then also through evolution. Um, if we look at urbanization going into the future over the next 20, 30, 40 years, urbanization will be, we project, one of the biggest drivers of habitat loss through, through uh, biodiversity loss, habitat loss, and also through um, rapid evolution. So you can see the taxa that will be most affected by urbanization will be reptiles, um, followed by uh, amphibians, mammals, and then to a lesser degree, uh, birds. A lot of this will be affected through, the process will be through the loss of habitat. And so the dominant style of urbanization all around the world today is disconnected, low density urban development. And that clearly has all these effects on food systems, on biodiversity, on land, and also on resources. So I'd like to spend the, the, the bulk of my time now talking about urbanization's impact on climate um, uh, and really coming off of the sixth assessment report that was just published a couple of months ago. I wanted to say, just to give folks a little bit of context, um, well, maybe I should ask, how many people here are familiar with the IPCC reports? So almost, uh, almost everyone is okay. So um, this was published in 2022. Um, the IPCC reports, when, when, when they talk about the IPCC reports, there are actually um, three key reports. One report is written by Working Group One, which is focused on the physical basis of climate change, measuring, understanding climate change processes. Working group two is focused on impacts and vulnerabilities to climate change. And working group three is focused on mitigating climate change. How do we arrest climate change? How do we slow down climate change? 
And you can imagine, even based on the titles of these three working groups, that very different scholars occupy these three working groups. So with working group one, you have primarily atmospheric scientists, atmospheric physicists, um, climatologists, hydrologists. Working group two, focusing on impacts and vulnerabilities, will have a lot of social scientists, a lot of anthropologists, geographers, um, political scientists. Working group three, focusing on mitigation, costs and benefits, will be occupied also by social scientists, maybe a little bit dominated by economists and others who are quantifying the, the benefits and the costs. I'm giving you this historical kind of history of the IPCC because up until the fifth assessment report, which was published in 2014, the IPCC never had a standalone chapter on cities in any of their working group reports. Instead, cities and urban areas were seen through other sectors. They were seen through buildings or transport, energy or land or agriculture, but there wasn't a standalone chapter on cities. And it wasn't until the fifth assessment report that a number of us started working with the IPCC and and there was a standalone chapter um, on in in working groups two and working group uh, working groups two and three, and many people said, well, uh, many people wanted to know why is it that the IPCC should focus on cities, because the IPCC's core um, uh, audience are national governments, and in fact, at the end of the fifth assessment report, the coordinating lead authors of each chapter, they defend the chapter in front of the entire IPC delegation. So these are members of countries that represent their country. They can then question the authors on any aspect of the report. And I will say that um, it is like do, you know, responding to your reviewer comments in live. <laughs> Uh, with politicians who aren't scientists. Um, and the first question, I will never forget, the first question that I was asked in 2014, you know, you can imagine, it's the first time I'd ever been involved with the IPCC before. I was ready to defend, you know, discuss any aspect of the science behind the report. But the very first question I was asked was, why is it that the IPCC should care about cities? because the audience are national governments. I wanted to give that story because just a few months ago, I, by Zoom, it was no longer in person, by Zoom we defended the, you know, we had the plenary to, to, to uh, take questions. And, and um, 2022 was so different from 2014 because no, no country representative asked me why cities are important. And clearly the, there is a recognition that cities are critical for solving the climate crisis. So um, one of the key findings of the most recent report is that if we look at the last 10 years, average annual greenhouse gas emissions are at their highest that they've ever been. And if we look at uh, global warming over uh, the last several hundred years, we see that the Earth has already warmed one degree since um, 1850. And the report concludes that we are not on track to limit global warming to one and a half degrees C. So if you look at um, where we are now, uh, this is from the report, um, you see that uh, the rate of growth here was a little bit lower than in the previous decade of 2000 to 2010, but the absolute uh, amount of greenhouse gas emissions are at its all-time high. One of the key conclusions of the recent report is that, and I'm gonna read this directly, unless there are immediate rapid and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to one and a half degrees C, will be beyond reach. I'm just gonna go back a couple of slides. Remember, we are already at one degree 
So we have very little time to make sure that we don't increase global temperatures by half a de degree C. If we wanted to limit w global warming to one and a half degree C, which is really only half a degree C, these are the things that we would need to do. We would need to have greenhouse gas emissions peak in the next three years. And we would need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% by 2030. So clearly, that's not going to happen. We would also need to simultaneously reduce methane by about a third by 2030. So clearly, that's not going to happen. So I put this up here because I think the one and a half degree C ship has sailed. If we want to limit global warming to around two degrees C, we would need to also have global greenhouse gas emissions peak before 2025 in about three years. And the rate of greenhouse gas reductions does not need to be so steep, but we still need to reduce by about 27% by 2030. Ooh. So I will let you make the conclusion as to whether this is achievable, whether we can reduce or limit global warming to two degrees C. Um, but the science is really clear that if we are to limit global warming, we would need to get to net zero very, very quickly. So it's not just about low carbon urban development, it's actually we're now changing the language to net zero carbon cities. The good news is that a very small portion of the world is responsible for a large portion, relatively large portion of emissions. Uh, this is a Lorenz curve that shows the share of the world's population and the share of total uh, carbon footprint. So you can see that something like 40% of the world's population is responsible for about 80% of the carbon footprint. So 40% of the world's population, 80% of the carbon footprint. If we were to look at cities, it's even a more optimistic story, and, I'm, and I mean that. So uh, optimistic in a couple of ways. Top 100 emitting cities account for 18% of the global carbon footprint. And I say optimistic because if we were to do something in those 100 cities, if those 100 cities were to implement strategies, mitigation strategies that could significantly reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to near or net zero, we would actually cancel out 18% of the global carbon footprint. So think back to a couple of slides to what we need to do to get to limit global warming to two degrees C. I think this seems a lot more achievable than trying to get 185 plus countries to agree on what they're going to do. So I do see this as glass is half full. Now, the most recent report, the most recent IPCC report concludes that about two thirds of carbon emissions can be attributed to existing urban areas. So if we think about cities as central to solving the climate crisis, I think there are two ways to think about this. One is all the cities that already have been built. So that's going back to this statistic. 100 emitting cities contribute to 18% of the global carbon footprint, and all the urban areas of the world contribute to about two-thirds of the carbon emissions. That's pretty significant. But again, remember the Lorenz curve. It's concentrated in you know, a couple hundred large cities. Those are the cities that have already been built, and a lot of this is operational energy. So it is the lighting, it's cooling, it's heating. But the other side of the story is all the cities that haven't been built, all the cities that haven't yet been built to accommodate the two and a half billion <laughs> more urban dwellers that are expected to be in the world by 2050. So 
We're adding two and a half billion more urban dwellers by 2050. That's equal to 20,000 American football fields every single day. This is the amount of infrastructure that will be needed to build out all those cities. So this study looks at um, the, the infrastructure and the carbon emissions, the, the urban CO2 emissions that's in the materials as well as to operate those, those cities. So we need to think about building net zero carbon cities as well as having net zero carbon cities be operationally net zero carbon. So again, I'm optimistic here. I think that actually the science is clear. It's not my, my opinion. The science is clear. We have the science to build cities, to build infrastructure that's net zero carbon. I think the biggest challenge is more on the governance, it's on the finance, it's on the institutional side. But this is the curve that we need to bend. The curve that needs to bend is the infrastructure curve and the operational energy curve. So clearly, how we build and how we design cities of tomorrow will be absolutely central to whether we keep global warming to two degrees C. But there's another part of the story that I haven't really, haven't talked about at all yet, um, which is how future urban development will actually affect climate, regional climate in those cities that are urbanizing. So how many people here are familiar with the urban heat island effect? Okay, everybody here. All right, so I won't explain what it is. Um, the urban heat island effect has been well studied for the last 40 years. What has not been well studied is how does large scale urban expansion affect regional climate and how that actually interacts with global climate change. So in other words, we know the factors that drive the urban heat island. It's primarily anthropogenic heat, it's materials, it's land use change, it's vegetation. But how does that actually interact with greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, methane, et cetera? So this is a study that, um, that one of my PhD students did a couple of years ago where he, asked, he answered that question. And what he found, and now others have found similarly, is that for many parts of the world that are going to be rapidly urbanizing, such as in Africa and such as in South Asia and in India, many parts of the world, urban-induced climate change will be greater than greenhouse gas-induced climate change. So in other words, many of these cities that are rapidly developing will actually modify their climate and increase temperatures more than CO2-driven climate change. But this is not additive what we're going to see in many parts of the world is that, and this is actually primarily going to happen in the tropical global south, urban development induced climate change, or it's more regional urban heat island, will have a non-linear effect interaction with greenhouse gas emissions driven climate change. And so, these parts of the world will have much more than a two degree C increase in temperature, significantly more. So uh, we found that urban expansion will increase daytime temperatures up to about 5.6 degrees C. That's actually only half of the story because this is daytime temperatures. There's another study that we did where um, my student looked at nighttime temperatures. And remember, one of the key characteristics of cities is our building's incredible ability to absorb and take on heat. And so the nighttime temperatures, when people are at home and sleeping and have often less adaptive capacity, that's actually when the, the we're gonna see much more of an increase in temperature is actually at night as buildings and urban environments slowly release the heats heat that has been trapped during, uh, during the day.
So the point here is that cities are going to modify their local climate through development. They're already modifying climate through urban activities and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But all of this can be turned into opportunities. And here, I, I think this is really the ex probably some of the most exciting work um, is, is really on the governance, the finance, the social aspects of how we can design and implement cities to be more sustainable. And here, I think that it's important to point out that I'm not talking about urban sustainability as sustainability within the city. I'm really talking about cities and urbanization as a process that can be leading the global sustainability challenge. And I hope that I've convinced you that on all four of these different dimensions, urbanization is central for whether food systems, biodiversity, climate either collapses or can become much more sustainable. I want to go back to this figure for a moment. And I think one of the dangers of having this paradigm implicit in how we think about cities is that it goes back to the fifth assessment report when a country government representative asked me, why should nation states care about cities? If our conceptualization of urbanization is that what stays in the city, what gets done in the city stays in the city, doesn't affect the world, then our, our view of solutions will be much more locally driven. I would argue there's a different way to think of conceptualize urbanization in the context of the environment. And I want to bring our attention to this paper written by Peter Vitusik in 1992. Um, and in that paper, he spelled out, he laid out um, a framework for thinking about global change or global environmental changes. And in that paper, he says that global environmental changes are those that alter the well-mixed fluid envelopes of the Earth system and hence are experienced globally. So that's one aspect of global change. And these are things like climate change, ozone hole, ocean acidification. So again, these global changes are, are, are changes that are affecting the, the envelope of the planet, right? That's one aspect of, of global change. But he then goes on to write that there's a second aspect of global change. And the second aspect is that these are changes that occur in discrete sites, but are so widespread as to constitute a global change. Land use change, deforestation, biodiversity loss, and I would argue urbanization should be considered global environmental change. There are a couple of reasons why having this framework could be incredibly powerful. It all comes down to money. So the ISSC is the International Social Science Council and ICSU was the International Council for Science. These are two international organizations that are e essentially federations of national science foundations, funding agencies from many different countries. And for many years, they were established in 1952 and 1931. For many years, these two organizations funded, I'm going to put in quotes, big science, big science programs. They funded big science programs such as the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, they funded the International Human Dimensions Program. These were programs that organized researchers to focus on particular topics, such as biodiversity loss, such as deforestation, um, health, and well being. A couple of years ago, these two science foundation or science organizations merged into a very large mega organization called the International Science Council. And their mandate is to, no, let me just back up. If you look on their website, you can see the many different members of the ISC. They are organizations like the US National Science Foundation, BMBF from Germany, right? So they're big funders of research. And if you look at the agendas of 
the ISSE and ICSU, um, urbanization, it reminds me of the way IPCC thought about urbanization in cities. It's through the lens of the other. It's through the lens of biodiversity. It's through the lens of climate change. It's through the lens of health. We don't have a global equivalent to assessing cities and urbanization. I would argue that if there were such a scientific endeavor, it would bring together, it would have to bring together the social sciences, the humanities, the natural sciences, and it would frame scientific scholarly research in a way that would have a direct impact on policy. So the work of the IPCC, we are actually, IPCC authors, we're not, I mean, our day jobs as a scientist is we're generating new science, but our job as an IPCC author is to assess the published literature. And the goal is that the IPCC reports directly feed into the UNFCCC policy-making process. Similarly, for biodiversity, there is an, uh, an international assessment of biodiversity called IPBES. This international assessment of biodiversity is literally the same as the IPCC on climate, but it's on biodiversity. And the goal is that this assessment report or these assessment reports directly feed into the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, many people, myself included, we applauded and we were uh, elated when the UN pass the Sustainable Development Goals. There's a standalone SDG 11 about sustainable cities and communities. And many of us were also elated when there was a new urban agenda. Those are great. However, those are one-time things, one-time actions. Um, this is an ongoing assessment that happens every five, eight-ish, ten-ish years that's directly feeding into the policy process. And I would argue that we're now at a stage in, in urban history and in human history where the urban is dominating so many aspects of not only our lives, but obviously the planet, that we need to have a different conceptualization of how cities and urbanization can be part of the solution. Many of us are now familiar with this term, the Anthropocene. I imagine many of you have heard about this. Geologists have now agreed that the Anthropos, the humans are we, we're do, you know, the dominant geologic force on the planet. Um, so even journals like The Economist talk about the Anthropocene, as well as scientific journals such as Nature, defining the Anthropocene. I would argue that we're actually beyond the Anthropocene. I would argue that we're in the astocene now, which is derived from the Greek word asti, where the, the dominant species on the planet are anthropos who live in the city. This would be a very different conceptualization of cities and solutions to a number of global environmental challenges. I will end with this positive note. Um, I do think that cities and the process of urbanization can be a force for good and certainly for sustainability. The good news is the majority, about 60, more, more than 60% of the projected urban areas on the planet by 2050 haven't been built. And so we know we can't design, build, and operate future cities the way that we have in the past. And we have the science to do it. It's a matter of bringing together the, the people, the decision makers, the finance together um, to make sure that cities of tomorrow are solutions to biodiversity, climate, uh, human well-being. Thank you very much for your attention, and I have time for lots of questions. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Karen, for uh, a presentation of global uh, significance as well as the timeliness. Uh, and I'm particularly f uh, fascinated by your new conceptualization uh, that cities as solutions uh, for climate change and the many uh, problems we have. So we now open to the floor. Any questions? Yes. Y if you can talk to the microphone, that'd be uh, greatly appreciated. Yeah, in the Hardlings University of Groningen, Netherlands. Maybe it's a simple question, but I don't quite see how cities can be a solution, even if we um, build energy producing buildings, even if we have uh, urban farming on all rooftops, uh, they will still uh, use a lot of raw materials. And uh, even we can't build all the buildings from, from clay or straw. So. Um, so isn't it too optimistic? There are other schoolers who say we will head uh, inevitably towards a societal collapse. So um, how can new cities be an exactly an opportunity? Yeah. So um, how can cities be an opportunity? And am I too optimistic? Is Are, are we just going to collapse? Because we're still going to need materials. You're absolutely right. Um, if we look at the demographic aspects of urbanization, it's very clear that societies that have urbanized, there are fewer births, so the, the birth rate is significantly lower. So that's already a big change, right? If we look at um, the Kuznets curve, you know, consumption as a function of either income or development, um, many societies, not all, including the one that I'm from in the US, many societies there seems to be a inversion where as economies or societies develop, there is an inflection point where they're not consuming as much. Doesn't always happen, but it can. Um, it's also very clear that urban areas can be much more efficient use of resources, whether it's land, copper, right? If you live in the countryside, you have beautiful ecosystem services, but if you want to go buy a carton of milk or a bag of milk, um, you know, you have to drive both ways versus if you're here, you can walk, right? You don't have to have the kind of transport energy costs. Um, there's a lot of energy and material savings to urban living. There, there's no doubt about that. So I think the, the contrast would be if we have two and a half billion more people in the planet by 2050, should they, would they be much more sustainable if they lived in urban areas, any type of urban settlement, or would they be more sustainable if they were in a more rural disperse? And it's very clear that it would be more sustainable in a, in a um, uh, urban settlement. I think the issue of resources, we have the technology and the know-how to recycle, reuse, um, uh, buildings and materials. Um, and also, we are not as creative as we can be with how we use these materials and buildings. Just as an example, many universities are not used in the evening. Uh, many buildings are not used in the evening. We could start thinking about 24-hour use of buildings in a way that, you know, there are many other things that don't have the long lag time of use um, airplanes are a good example. Airplanes, you know, modern airplanes, they take off, they land, they refuel, they take off again. Um, the sharing economy is made possible through, through um, denser living. We don't really want a refrigerator. We want our food to be cold and not be spoiled. Um, and so we could go towards an economy that's more about sharing we're used to sharing houses now through Airbnb. We're used to sharing cars. So I think that we're not going to get to a net zero materials with urbanization. I think that we can think much more out of the box to think about what are the services that we want out of refrigerators and cars. Most people don't really want a car. I mean, there's the status symbol of a car and a convenience of a car, but what we really want is mobility and accessibility. So. Many of these things are made possible by co-location of where people live with where they work, more dense, but not super dense. Um, so I think that it is possible. 
But there's a whole other, you know, I've really talked about the environmental aspects. There's a whole other human well-being, human development side that's strongly correlated with urbanization. You know, opportunities for women in education, sanitation, health. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, hello. <coughs> Um, my name is Edward Heibens. Uh, another comment from the Netherlands, Wageningen University in this case. Uh, indeed, this is a high topic on the agenda in the densely populated Netherlands about the urbanization. And, uh, <coughs> but um, my question was, I mean, uh, thank you for the wonderful overview and, and drawing attention to the fact, of course, that urban areas are the, are the motor of climate change in many ways and, and, uh, and, and the aspects thereof. You mentioned the one thing in, in a passing, or maybe I missed it, you said it, it's all about the money in the end. Oh, sorry, it's all about the money. And, and that's indeed the point, because uh, as, as what I've heard, I've heard estimates of up to a third of the uh, residential housing stocks, it's empty. It's speculative finance that's building the cities. And with money being printed at an accelerating rate every year now to meet every cr cr reoccurring crisis, I mean, the Frankfurt uh, Central Bank is just churning out euros like massively. We see it in the housing prices and interest rates and inflation. and. And basically, as David Harvey would argue, I mean, the urbanization of today is, is, is basically money-seeking spatial fix. Um, now, you didn't, of course, address the driving forces of uh, maybe urbanization to that extent, but maybe if you reflect a little bit on that, I mean, the, the, uh, the intricate relationship with the economy and how we are running the economy at the moment and, and urbanization as an effect of speculative finance. Just a comment, maybe on reflection. Thank you. Uh, so I would say if you look at the literature on, let's say, urban development in a lot of East Asia, I mean, certainly in China, certain parts of, of Korea, but certainly in China, um, mayors have been using their land as bank, right, banks. And as that's a main way to get, um, to, to build up uh, uh, finance uh, for, for, for mayors and local decision makers. Um, yeah, there's a lot of literature on this. It's very clear that we're overbuilding. I mean, it completely defeats the idea that cities should be part of the solution. If you overbuild and all of these, it's, a, it's not only that the stock stays empty, it's also the embodied carbon costs of manufacturing and mining and developing all this space that doesn't get used, not to mention the land that doesn't get used. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, another big aspect to this. Also related to this that I don't talk about here, but I've published on it, is the role of international corporations as they, uh, you know, in, in the international labor market. It used to be that the labor market was primarily around where you had your headquarters or, you know, your, the, a particular city. But now international companies are literally moving country to country, city to city, largely based on land prices, but even more importantly, on labor costs. So um, I've done studies in my lab, we've done studies, and this is now about a decade back, where we <coughs> interviewed a number of uh, technology companies to understand, you know, why are they moving to Bangalore? Why are they moving to Shenzhen? Why are they moving to uh, Pune? What's driving these companies to move there? And what are the impacts of companies moving there on urban development? <coughs> Excuse me, and it's very, very clear that they're trying to go to places where there's the the, the educa ed educated labor pool, but most important, where labor prices are low, and labor price is strongly correlated with land prices, right? And so um, there were a number of companies that we had interviewed where they said, you know, we used to be in Bangalore, but now Bangalore real estate price is too high and labor market's too high. We're now moving to Pune. And then our next city is going to be this other cities, right? So we're already seeing that. That's also driving urban development in a different way. So yeah, that's what, you, what you've just mentioned is a, a really important aspect to all of this. It's not only local finance, it's international finance. That's a big part of it. It's also international developers. It's um, yeah, there's a whole other aspect to this that I didn't talk about. But thank you for raising that. Uh, hi, and thank you for the presentations. Very, very insightful. Uh, I'm Fred Ramos, I'm from Brazil. 
And um, I participated in a research in urban, uh, urbanization in the Amazon forest. And there is a very important uh, geographer, that, uh, Bertha Berker, who said that uh, urbanization is a key to save the forest. We should uh, uh, see urbanization as, as a, a good opportunity to keep the forest uh, uh, alive. So we, we should not neglect the, the urban side of the, the forest. And then she brings to the concept of extended urbanization. So, uh, and I saw you in your first slide, you started with a very clear uh, picture showing a city with a very clear boundaries defined it. Uh, so uh, my question is, in what extent do you think uh, the current debate can see the city as an organizing of, of regions beyond looking beyond only the specific site of the uh, urban landscape or the urbanized landscape or the impervious surface and to understand the, the systematic uh, uh, footprint that cities can uh, generate around, surround them locally and regionally. So in what extent this debate, this, the debate is aware of this, of the, the, the potentialities to see cities as, as this organizing uh, nodes for, for the bigger network in, in the panel such as IPCC. Yeah, Thank so uh, that is a, a very interesting uh, question. Um, in the most recent IPCC report, the urban mitigation chapter is actually called urban systems, urban systems. In the fifth assessment report published in 2014, it was called spatial plan urban area, spatial planning, and infrastructure. So it was much more about planning, urban form, and a place. And in this report, it's very much about urban systems. And I think pre-COVID, most people would not know what supply chains are. But now everybody is familiar with supply chains. And I think that that is a critical lens to think about cities, is that cities are a node in a very large global system about 75% of the global economy is generated in urban areas, about. If you look at uh, around 1900, it was, <clears throat> 1900, I think it was closer to about like 20%. I have to go back and look at the numbers. I may have the number wrong, but the order of magnitude is about right. right? So the urban area cities they you know you this gentleman here is saying you know they're the motor for climate change they're obviously the motor for the global economy and so if we think about what everything from deforestation food production energy all of that is funneling to to funneled into cities to make them vibrant and productive um, i think the question about whether urbanization is central for saving the forest i think is a really interesting one um, there's some very interesting work that's being done in Nepal and also in India asking that very question. As Nepal urbanizes, as India urbanizes, and people leave the countryside and go to cities, what will happen to forests? Will they actually regenerate as people no longer use them for wood fuel and they use maybe fossil fuel? Or will there be more of an impact on forests because they need lumber, and resources from the forest to build their cities. What's interesting is that um, the effects are different depending on where you're looking. So there's a lot of evidence that forests in Nepal are regenerating because people are abandoning the countryside and going into the city. But the opposite is, we are seeing the opposite to be true in some parts of India, that as people move into the city, there's actually a greater demand for forest products, greater demand for both raw materials, extractive materials from forests, also food and wild foods from forests. So, you know, whether cities are going to be the solution or not, it's, it's unclear. Um, there's one other dimension to this, which is quite interesting, I think, which is going back to finances. If you look at the large international conservation organizations, the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, World Wildlife Fund, most of those funds come from people who live in cities. So there's this other aspect of people moving into cities wanting to conserve the other. And so that could be another aspect to this. 
it's obviously very complex. And uh, before we go to the next question in the room, uh, we do have uh, online questions. Well, y yes, thanks. We have a, a question from Trent Brown. It might be related actually to, the, to what you were just talking about. But, um, they ask, what would your ideal pattern of urbanization look like? Do you see potential in more decentralized urbanization, so growth in smaller urban centers rather than mega cities? I'm guessing it might, might be related to what you were just saying there as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, absolutely, yes. Decentralization, decentralization of many different things, whether it's energy supply, water provision. Um, there's a reason why cities and their infrastructure were centralized. You know, many of us, many of you know about the sanitary city movement, et cetera. Um, but mega cities are generally not as efficient. Uh, they're not as efficient in terms of governance. They're not as efficient in terms of resources. Um, and then if you look at the capacity of the, um, of the geography to actually dissipate and absorb pollution, whether it's water, air, et cetera, from very large cities, um, it overwhelms the ability to do so. And so smaller cities uh, in clusters would be definitely much more sustainable, much more efficient. Um, that's in terms of size. But in terms of the patterns within the city, that's actually even more important than the actual size. You could have three cities of the exact same size, but with very, very different internal configuration and layouts that have very different impacts on the environment. The city that's the most environmentally sustainable is one where people are co-located to their destinations, whether your destination is work or school or um, you know, the grocery store. So planning for small blocks for high intersection density is really essential, combined with smaller settlement sizes. Um, it seems to be, the, the literature seems to conclude that there's some consensus that a sweet spot is around the one to three million mark. Um, you know, if you get to larger cities of like five million, 10 million, it's just very difficult to manage unless they are managed in terms of lots of different neighborhoods. And now we have the, a gentleman over there. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Leonard Schließer from Durham University. Um, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, and I have maybe a thought that is a bit connected. So 20,000 football <laughs> fields becoming urban space um, up to 2050. My immediately, the first thought was how much of this space is actually becoming toxic or inhabitable by our doings by climate change. Mm -hmm. And maybe connected to that is, well, you had this idea that in cities, especially like said, the sanitation is better, the, um, the health provisioning might be better, right? In the rural areas, an ambulance takes, for example, much more time. Um, and in city, that might be different. But on the other side, and coming from my roots, uh, research in critical infrastructure is, aren't cities then also more dangerous to live in? As soon, because as soon as these infrastructures that support our living fail, then we get relatively quickly in relatively big problems. I mean, we have seen it with the past big hurricanes, with the past uh, big storms, right? The flooding in the subway just as, as something. You might say that we can solve with technical solutions, but maybe the provocation is, will cities innovatively not also lead to us dying quicker or at least suffering more intensely um, as we move, we move more and more people move into cities? Thank you. Yeah, there's this whole other literature. Um, if you look at the writings of Louis Betancourt or um, Jeff West and others, they're, um, I don't know how many people are familiar with their literature. So these are physicists and biologists that are looking at scaling laws in cities. And one of the, their conclusions is that you know, cities, as they get larger, the metabolism of the city increases. There and there needs to be like a step function to increasing innovation. So that essentially as cities get bigger, they, you need to constantly be in this, um, this cycle of innovating just to maintain the provision of the services that the city currently has. And so by that argument, you could make the argument that you know, 
by that logic, rather, you could make the argument that if cities don't constantly innovate, um, innovate whether it's technologically or otherwise, um, they are actually much more vulnerable to some kind of collapse if they're not innovating. So there is this whole other literature on that, which is not critical infrastructure literature, but it's really looking at scaling laws in cities. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mia. I'm from LMU University in Munich. And um, I have a question that brings another topic to the table, I think, which is a socially just transformation. Because if I apply what you just said to the city I do research on, this is Jakarta in Indonesia, I would agree that there's a lot of opportunities and also potential for adaptation in the city. But when I think about who is actually implementing the adaptation in the end, it's again more in elite hands. And when we apply this to the entire global context, I'm wondering who is then driving these transformations and who are they good for and who will actually suffer? So what is your take on a socially just transformation in that context? I, I think that that's a pretty simple answer. I mean, that has to be a central part if we think about sustainability broadly and not just environmentally, in, environmental sustainability. The socially just, just transition has to be a central part. I mean, one of the biggest challenges to sustainable urbanization, so I've been talking about urbanization as central to environmental sustainability, but if we think about one of the key fundamental aspects of sustainable urbanization as these processes that I talked about, growing inequality would be arguably one of the biggest challenges. So yeah, that's, that's, that goes without saying. Yeah, hi, uh, Phil Hubbard, King's College London. Um, one of the things you seem to be saying sounds very akin to the arguments of the co for the compact city that we hear quite frequently. So cities that are large but not too large, dense but not super dense. You made a lot about co-location and that seems to be a key argument. We hear it in the 15 minute city idea in Europe a lot. And in the, uh, the UK at the moment, for example, these type of environmental justifications are used for building higher and more compact in cities. We see it in Newcastle. You look around, there are lots of new, quite high-rise buildings since I last was here. And they're not student halls of residence. They often look like it. They're post-student. They're for young professionals. So that's, there's two things going on. There's demolition of low-rise, and there's no reuse of that, and they may have been useful buildings. Mm. And then you've got this quite energy-hungry, vertical infrastructure involved. So you talked a little bit earlier on about kind of volumetric. I mean, building high, but how high? Dense, but how dense? Can you just maybe speak a little bit yeah. more to that kind of lateral versus yep. vertical? Yep. Thanks. So in the fifth assessment report, we actually talk about it, and we have a, some diagrams that show that when we talk about co-location, that's the key thing. We want to increase the accessibility. We want to co-locate people, origins with destinations. Yes, compactness is part of it, but it's not just compactness, because if we have compactness, you have this verticality, which, as you just said, clearly re requires a lot of energy and materials. The sweet spot seems to be about four to six stories, roughly, because then the energy requirements to build and to operate the buildings is relatively low, and the kind of materials and the energy intensity of the materials tends to be relatively low. Now, that is with the, I would say, with the, um, with the, with the, uh, designs that are more commonly used now. There are innovations that are being made in uh, timber industries and timber cities. Um, one of my colleagues at, at Yale, Alan Organsky, he and uh, a number of other architects uh, with people in the forest industry, um, and actually in my environment school, the silviculturists, looking at how you can build uh, tall buildings with certain types of timber. So these are timber buildings that now I know some of you are like, oh, the Great Fire of London. <laughs> um, these are actually, they're, they're fireproof, but also they don't have the energy emissions um, intensity as like l using reinforced steel. So if you were to build a timber city or timber buildings, uh, you could actually build much higher than four to six story, but you still have the operational energy cost. So it's weighing the embodied energy with mining and building with the operational energy 
And then there's the whole other aspect of the urban heat island and then how much of vegetation and uh, impervious surface do you need for a building, you know, for foundation for a building that's like 20 or 30 stories high. Taller, the short answer is taller and taller is not the way to go. Yeah. Great. Because there's this whole other aspect of the human scale and what, you know, the, how we actually connect to the built environment. The psychological aspects of this, the mental well-being aspects of this. All right. Uh, although that our session officially ends at uh, six thirty, but uh, the next session, plenary session, actually starts at six thirty. So, uh, Professor Sita and I had a discussion that we probably end this session at uh, six fifteen. But uh, certainly, if you have questions, feel free feel free to come forward and uh, talk to her. Um, and I would just want to say that uh, you know, I uh, want to second. Uh, Professor Seater's comment that uh, uh, I'm so very impressed uh, with uh, how many people showed up <laughs> for this late afternoon uh, session, and it appears that uh, everybody hungry for uh, the food for thought, right? So mm -hmm. let's give uh, a final round of applause to our keynote speaker uh, for giving us so much food for thought. Thank you. Thank you.